must be really tough at times to just go, okay, cut through it all. What is right for me? What is right for my child and, and our family? And uh, wow, so that's really great advice. I think finding that center and connecting with yourself and your, and your child um, is actually really good uh, thinking, I reckon. Yeah. Amen. I mean, that's, that's all that matters also in your life. That's why I think it's such a good example. Like this podcast is about different people's stories and mm. how they made decisions. And I think the same guiding principle should apply. Like it doesn't matter what the best outcome is for other, other people or what like success might've been defined like in your parents' time, like choose what success looks like for you and define it. Maybe it means a graduate degree. Maybe it means a good day watching football with your friends. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care, but like know it for yourself because if you don't know it for yourself, you're going to inadvertently interpret someone else's version of what mm -hmm. success looks like and then measure yourself all the time by their standards and never feel like you're always going to feel like you're coming up short. Always. Totally. So it's such a great, uh, it's such a great lesson. And, uh, you know, unfortunately not everyone takes, takes that sort of advice or thinks of things like that, but it, but it is really important, you know, just like govern yourself by what you, th what is important to you in your life and, and don't compare because everyone's comparing and you're never going to be like, you know, that other person. So, um, really cool advice there. So basically, yeah, sorry. Oh no! Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just saying, I'm, I don't get it right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, there's definitely moments where I feel like crap about myself, but we're also human. Like, of course, you have to allow yourself. I don't know. And this is where I think tribes are really important. Like, you need to have people in your life. Like, everyone needs a Gareth and a Craig, you know, to like talk about these things with, who are also on the same page. To be like, oh yeah, that sucks, and like maybe I don't have an answer, but we are gonna sit here in the muck with you and like have an honest conversation about what's going on. And that's yeah. how you get through it. Like you just totally. get better day by day. Exactly. Yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. We like that. So I know we've touched on it, you know, a couple of times already in our chats and um, may maybe there's something more to this. Uh, so you said that part of the reason uh, you left your, your marketing agency job was because your name is Margot and uh, being called Margot has had a big influence on your life. And, you know, you've had, you've made important decisions off the back of that too. So maybe you can go into that a little bit deeper if there's something else to it. Sure. Yeah, no, we, we touched on it, but I'll, I'll go a little deeper that when I, I like looking at life sort of holistically and I'm going to say it differently. It's a, it's such a big topic. I don't want to look back at my life with regret. And there are a lot of people that I meet in the day to day who, in my view, are living quiet lives of just desperation. And that to me is always my biggest fear because of Margot. Um, I think so many people have circumstances in their life that they can't control or are born into something really terrible. And that's what my family had, right? Like they were born into something that they couldn't control and they didn't have any options. So when I look at people who have options, and they aren't maximizing them or they're not feeling good in a life full of options, it makes me profoundly sad. Um, and I know that we often feel like we don't have options. Like we feel like victims and we feel like we don't have choices. And when I think about Margot, I remind myself that I absolutely do have a choice. I have a choice in how I respond. I have a choice in my attitude. I have a choice in um, I am lucky enough to have a choice in so much more because I wasn't born in 1940s, you know, uh, Europe. And I like am a Jew in a time where that's not a big deal. Um, and there are so many, there are so many things that I consider a privileged life that I have options. And so I just don't want to waste that and defining what it means to waste that is up to me. Right. There's a lot of ways that if I, that I can like judge myself poorly, mm. if I say like, I'm going to waste it because I'm going to push myself to have a life that isn't mine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about really evaluating my choices in my life and thinking, okay, there were so many people in my family who didn't get to live their lives. Like their lives were cut short unfairly. So I have an obligation and a duty to live a good life, period. I feel entitled to a good life. And I, I, I often laugh when people are like, millennial generation, you're so entitled. Yeah, yeah, I think we are because we are the first generation in the history of the world to have options. Mm -hmm. So I don't see why it's a bad thing to feel like you're entitled to not hate your life when that is an actual <laughs> outcome you can have for the first time in human 
freaking history. Like, <laughs> it blows my mind that this is a bad thing. Like, I, I, I just don't believe in the, the vestige of suffering. Like, I don't think that we need needless suffering. We live in a time where, you know, like, remember, 250 years ago, the richest person in the world was shitting in a bucket in their room in a chamber pot. Like they still didn't have a toilet, right? We have a time where this is no big deal. Like even if you are the least wealthy person in America, you still have to have a cell phone if you want to get a job. I mean, we live in really an insane time if you think about it. And um, so to me, that's always such a privilege <laughs> and it's so beautiful. And that's something that shouldn't intimidate us. Like I want to lean into that and say, okay, how do I craft a life that's in alignment with what I believe a good life looks like. Does that mean family? Does that mean impact? Does that mean friends? That Does that mean a suburban life? Does that mean, like, whatever it means, like, at least having, like, I would feel like I didn't do justice to Margot if I wasn't having this conversation with myself every single day and if I wasn't raising my kid in that way. Um, mm. And that's that's really what lit the fire under my ass for so much of this. <laughs> so, so, so from writing and, and doing it for such a long time, what what is your advice to like write good and what are uh, to write well? Should I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, so and then also like what are good writing habits? Yes. So <laughs> there's no other skill in the world that you can acquire passively. Like you cannot, you can't watch the Olympics on ice skating and like get better at ice skating. But if you read a lot, you actually will get better at writing. Um, and so this is one thing that I always tell people who want to improve their writing is this read people whose writing you respect um, and that you enjoy. And those might not be the same category. So like make sure you read both. Um, because I think a failure a lot of us make is we'll read what we think is important or what our friends have told us to read or what might hit the list. And I actually think that that's a huge mistake um, in part because there's so much crap that's published that's just not good. Um, and there's so many classics that no one has, pays attention to that are so, so powerful that can influence your reading and, um, sorry, influence your writing. And one of the ways you discover your voice and get good at refining your voice is by copying other people's voices. So I remember I went through, like, I read all of Ogilvy's books and for a long time, my writing sounded like him. And it took me a while before I got him out of my head. And then I moved on to a Claude Hopkins phase and I moved, like, you, you go through each writer and you start mimicking them until you've integrated so many of them that it becomes mm -hmm. yours. And so it, it took me years to get to that point. But I would say if somebody um, wants to get good at writing, number one, read people that you respect and that you enjoy. Um, and then number two, ass in the chair. Get your ass in the chair and write. I think that prolificness is a really big part of this. Uh, and the hardest part people have is, is sitting down and writing really, really badly. Um, and like knowing sort of the process of writing, which is, I don't care how talented you are. I don't care if you were told all throughout your childhood years, you're talented and you're great and you're really good at writing. That's actually going to hurt you down the line because you're going to think your writing is supposed to be good because everyone told you it was good. Um, it's kind of like what you were saying earlier, Craig, about like ignorance is bliss sometimes. Um, <laughs> It, the goal I have for people is like always start knowing that the first thing you put down is crappy. Just like expect it to be crappy and get the crap out of the way. Just be like, I'm just going to write a whole crappy page and maybe there'll be one salvageable thing from it. And when you take like expectations off and you start the writing practice, you actually start to get better because this is where it actually gets good. There is no one who sits down and does a first version that's perfect. Mm we were presented with a very false model. Like I remember reading, you know, published works of, you know, it would be like Hemingway's diary or something. And you, there's something called a movable feast, which was like his diary from when he lived in France. And I remember thinking, Oh God, this is just how this man thought. Like someone saw my diary from this part of my life. They'd be like, wow, she's an idiot. Um, and <laughs> the crazy thing is like, those things are edited. They're all edited, right? Like nobody's first version makes any sense. We're all really self-conscious and we all use too many adverbs and we say like and um, <laughs> whatever the written version of that is. And we're super <laughs> verbose and we'll say things in 20 lines that could only be one line, but like there's no way to get to that without getting to the shitty, going through the shitty first draft first. Yeah. yeah. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape fold my 